Um, so again, welcome everyone. Um, so today we are going to be um, sharing these beautiful uh, stories and artworks. Uh, I would like to introduce myself a little bit. My name is Mona Lurch. I run two global platforms for women artists. One is called um, Art Moms United. As the title suggests, that is um, mainly highlighting women artists who are also parents and caregivers. And then uh, the other platform that is what we are here for today is Women United Art Movement. Without um, further ado, let me introduce Gia Haddad. She is an artist and writer for over 30 years. She graduated in uh, graphic design and art history in 1991 and is currently a practicing artist pursuing a master's in museum studies. She's passionate about examining the identities of underrepresented women. She creates with the explicit belief that art has the power to provoke positive social change and that artists are responsible for using it as a vehicle for such change. And Gia, it's your turn. Please, can you introduce yourself and your work and then yes. we'll, together we'll look at your show. Yes. So um, um, I am concerned, as you spoke earlier, uh, to um, give a voice to the underrepresented women, um, especially the women from the Global South. Um, and particularly Arab women, since I am an Arab woman, um, because I feel like we are at a point in history where uh, the the disconnect uh, between East and West, uh, between South and North, uh, between what's considered civilized and what's sadly considered uncivilized, uh, but isn't, uh, is at its height and it's creating um, more negativity in the world that will leads to more conflict, more injustice, more wars. Uh, so if we can do our part in um, readjusting this conversation uh, through visual means, hopefully powerful visual means, and resetting some of these cultural uh, presets uh, so that we can communicate better, hopefully. Uh, particularly listen to stories that aren't told or at all or aren't told properly. Uh, so that's basically what I, what I try to do with my art. Um, I'm very passionate about uh, using mediums that are not standard, uh, basically adding fabric, embroidery, beads uh, to a canvas that has paint on it um, because of a, of, a, of a knowledge that I had through my art history uh, education, uh, which um, clarified the fact that for some reason, or for for actually a definite reason, uh, fiber arts and and um, textile arts and embroidery, lace, all of that, beading was considered um, the work of women. The work of it was um, associated with domesticity, with femininity, and therefore, in the nineteenth century, uh, the Royal Academy of Arts in Europe uh, banned it from from the realm of high art. And therefore, all these stories uh, that were told through this medium were untold and disappeared. And therefore, countless voices of women disappeared with it. And that's only uh, in the Western world. Uh, in the Eastern world and the rest of the world, uh, everything that's considered exotic and primitive, if found, if seen, if heard, is put in another room, in the back room in a museum or in a specialized museum, where uh, at the onset it's considered lesser or um, not of the same conversation. So what I aim to do through adding these mediums that are considered crafty to high arts, hopefully, <laughs> I will change that conversation and add a few more voices uh, that are textural as well. So that, that is what I try to do with my art. Uh, we can start if you want to look at the individual pieces. So the, the show is called The Fabrics of Our Lives. And it made a few of the, my friends chuckle because it reminded them of uh, the soap uh, <laughs> um, by the similar name. Uh, but uh, yes, maybe maybe it is um, the story of drama because it, it talks about um, it's a play on words that talks about the fabrics that we uh, as women from the global south uh, have in our lives because we are very 
um, we are very sensory people. And so what we wear and what we embroider and what we touch uh, is our everyday art form and our everyday art of expression. Uh, and therefore it's, it is at the essence of our sensory lives. Uh, and it's also uh, the other meaning, which is the English meaning, the fabric of our lives, what we are made of. Uh, what we are made of, in fact, rather than what people think or may have an impression that we are made of. Uh, and that's what I am exposing uh, through my pieces in this show. So we can start to look at them. Um, this, is, uh, this is part of a, of a, of a three-piece series uh, that's called Art from the Edge. And where I uh, think about and examine the space that was granted to women in art, uh, that was granted in history, the, in art, and con in contemporary art. And as a lot of other uh, groups uh, and activists and artivists are doing these days, they are commenting on collections that don't have any women in them and asking why and working a lot of museums are working on increasing the, per the percentage of uh, representation of women artists in their collections and so this series was concerned with addressing that um, idea and uh, more so the idea of the place of women in art but women of color uh, who are if 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 white women don't have a, a big place in 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 art collections in the west women of color have even more uh, lesser percentages of them. And so this was the first one uh, that addressed that um, issue. The one next to it um, also addresses the, the under it, the one under it, yes. So again, I use fabric for the background and yarn for the hair uh, and oil paint for the portrait. And I put them together um, with the subject, uh, the figure on the edge, to show uh, the space that is uh, relegated to women, uh, particularly women that are not uh, Western, uh, to in, in the space that is relegated for art. Uh, so that was the second one. The third one is on the right, um, addresses, the same, addresses the same issue. And uh, this one is called, um, um, uh, uncivilized and it, I painted it when um, the war in Ukraine started and for some reason all the coverage uh, that <laughs> that was about the Ukraine and how terrible uh, what was happening was was tainted with but this is Europe uh, the, this is a civilized place it's not an uncivilized place like in the Middle East where war is expected and and I found that word uncivilized very telling of our time uh, because of the structural or cultural presets that are um, pre-assigned to people depending on where they are from. Uh, and we decide there is one uh, way to be civilized and, and the rest of the world um, is deemed uncivilized. So that's where, where this particular painting came from. But it's also part of the effort to include um, string and fabric uh, with oil painting on a canvas and see what happens, how people react to it. Um, as with all my paintings, I invite people also always to touch them uh, and feel them and interact with them. Also in a way to challenge uh, the presets for uh, what is considered high art and what we put behind glass and what we are scared to touch because it is considered, you know, it's almost idol idolatry at this point. Uh, I say no. Art, art for me is is of the everyday. Um, it's it's pieces uh, of things that I touch and feel. And so the art that I put on my canvas also is feelable, touchable art. Uh, and it's also um, uh, fa fragile, and it can be ruined, and that's okay because it's also an expression of who we are as people, fragile people who. Um, want to be touched and want to feel fragile and um, human. So th this series addresses all of these issues. Uh, the one on top um, addresses the, the subject of, it's called Your Weight in Gold. And it's um, talking about the standards of body uh, image and beauty in the world and how 
um, women all over the world suffer uh, trying to live up to these standards, uh, but women of color more so because of the way that they are um, presented with an ideal that has nothing to do with them, nothing to do with their skin, nothing to do with their hair, nothing to do with the DNA and the shapes of their bodies. And um, they have to struggle uh, even more um, than other women to try and live up to that ideal. Um, this woman is wearing a traditional Arabic dress with, with embroidery. And a lot of our dresses have gold embroidery in them. And uh, I am urging this woman to, to think of her weight in gold uh, in what she represents in her clothing and her culture and the fabric behind her, rather than in the images that she is asked to live, to live up to. Um, so that's your weight in gold. Um, the next three paintings, if we can see them together, um, they're called the skirt series. And um, I, I sewed the same skirt three times and I put it on three different women. And I talked about three different issues uh, of women uh, of color. The one in the middle was the first one and it was inspired by the Black Lives uh, Movement and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, it's called Don't Skirt. And it's talking about, um, it's urging people not to skirt the issues that are important in the world. Um, Black Lives Matter and all the other um, Black women in the world that are suffering from the same um, stereotyping and judgment that is made every day. Um, and that we, we see on the news more and more. Uh, so we are, at, at the end of the day, all women are wearing the same skirt. We might have different shapes, uh, different colors, different everyday issues, but we are all facing basically the same uh, battles. We all have the same hopes and dreams. Uh, we all care for the same things in life. We all want the same things in life, uh, no matter where we come from and, and what the color of our skin is. Uh, the, the woman on the left, uh, it's called Same Skirt, Different Tribe. And I made that one during COVID when um, there was an attack on uh, people of Asian descent all over the world. Uh, and I felt like this time, these women were wearing this skirt. Um, and on the right are the women who are wearing a scarf on their head. It's called My Skirt, My Choice. And it's also talking about the prejudice that happens, uh, the double standard that happens, uh, and the, the, the first impression that is given when a woman is wearing a scarf on her head and all the presumptions that are made about her before she even opens her mouth, before people know who she is and where she's from and what she's about uh, already, uh, like when her skin is dark, in the case of black women, especially in the United States, decisions are made about her and who she is and what she wants and what she stands for. And, but in fact, she's wearing the same skirt as all the other women on earth. Um, so this is the skirt series. Um, the next uh, painting is an offshoot of the skirt series and it's uh, addressing an issue also, again, uh, that concerns all women on earth and it's body image and the standards that we have to live with uh, in terms of weight and body weight and all the um, food and eating disorders that happen because of uh, what we face, um, wearing that skirt, the skirt of living up to an ideal that frankly, 1% of women can embody and the rest of them are struggling their whole lives uh, to reach and never can. So, um, this one is called Hiding Underneath My Skirt. Uh, the next one, um, this is an ongoing series. This is the first of them. I'm working on them right now. And uh, they're called Flowers for Her Hair. Uh, and it addresses the issue of hair. Um, all women have hair, hair problems, hair issues, hair worries, whether it's bodily hair, or hair on her head, whether there is hair on their head or there isn't because of sickness or DNA or choice. 
uh, how people feel about that and view it, the decisions that are made about us because of our hair, whether we leave it natural, whether we um, put keratin in it, whether we do dreadlocks and whether we, you know, so all, all the judgment, all the decisions that come with hair, uh, bodily hair, <laughs> and what that means and what that has meant to us, uh, the amount of money, and um, worry and heartache that we have we spend during our lives worrying about hair so my question with this series is what if we had flowers instead of hair what would happen then and so each of them is a symphony in a certain color and this one was a symphony in pink and it was dedicated to the month of february i mean the month of october for um for breast cancer awareness month and i was commenting about uh, all the ribbons, the pink ribbons and the pink flowers and the pinkness that people start selling <laughs> for profit uh, once October starts. Um, and people feel good about themselves by wearing these, these pink flowers, uh, when in fact, these pink flowers don't help anyone except the person who's selling them gets money, the person who's wearing them feels good. Uh, they're not saving any lives. So with this painting, I'm saying, Okay, wear the pink flower, but donate, encourage, help, um, raise awareness, do something about it. Um, there are two more of the series in the works right now that are not in this show that I hope you will see at some point. Um, this one on the left uh, is part of a series called Decolonizing History. And uh, it's one of three paintings of Arab queens. Um, there was Zenobia and Cleopatra, and this one, this particular one, is called Al Hurra. And uh, Al Hurra is the queen of Morocco, um, who was a queen in the 11th century, and um, she ruled over a city state on the coast of Morocco. And she is known in Western history as the Pirate Queen. Because what she did was she had um, many ships that were um, that she used to defend the coast of Morocco from Portuguese and Spanish ships that would uh, come looking for um, loot, basically, uh, from the, the native people. And what she was doing was she was protecting her um, territory, her, her, her city state and, and the edges of that ocean of that sea so um she became known as the pirate queen because again in history um when it's somebody from this global south who is protecting their territory they are known as pirates um and i i am in the ue right now and the ue used to be known as the coast of pirates because we were at some point protecting our uh our shores from the british uh when the british liked us, they changed our name to the Trusha state. So uh, again, she was known as the Pirate Queen. And in all the pictures, uh, the Orientalist pictures in that you see in art, in Western art, she is, you know, wearing a pirate suit on a ship with a sword. Um, and I say that Hora never went on a ship. Uh, all she did was um, lead the city state and lead these vessels. Uh, so I decided to reimagine Asayid al Hurra as I would think she was looking, uh, not as a pirate queen with a with a sword and a and a and a pirate bandana, uh, but as a queen would be looking at that time in in history, in that uh, part of the world. Um, so that's Asayid al Hurra. <laughs> um, this is uh, the first, the study for a series that I did later um, called the Bright Series. Um, I Dream in Color, it was called. And this was a study for it. And I was looking at different bridal um, fabrics and what brides wore uh, throughout history. And I was taken by this, um, this cap that was called the Julius cap that was uh, popular in the 20, 20s, the 1920s. Uh, referring to the cap that Juliet, Juliet from Romeo and Juliet wore um, in the Shakespearean time. And this cap came back into fashion in the 70s uh, when, you know, brides that were a bit hippie 
uh, started wearing it like it was a, a vagabondish look for a bride. Um, and I remember the pictures of my own grandmother who, who was married, you know, between the 20s and the 30s. And um, I was fascinated by the amount of, of lace and uh, how these caps were worn and uh, where they came from. And so this was a study uh, to prepare for the bride series. Um, the one under it uh, addresses a universal issue um, that is, you know, mo all women who have had kids um, will worry mostly about these kids' is safety and well-being. And uh, I painted this painting on the Children's Day, UNICEF Children's Day, and it's called I Exist, and it's a tribute to all the kids who are looking and seeing things they're not supposed to be seeing and hearing. Uh, from behind whatever drape they are hidden or hiding um, and where adults around them are not noticing uh, that they exist or that they are watching or that they are hearing, be it with a situation that involves a war and violence or um, in a domestic, uh, uh, the domestic problem household where the kids are watching and hearing things that will affect them for the rest of their lives and nobody realizes that. Uh, so this was a tribute to these children. Um, again, this is called Mirror and it addresses again another um, painting that talks about body image and um, what we go through as women trying to constantly hide our figures and the numbers on the scale from everybody. Um, and always feeling like we are failing. This recurring theme of losing weight and gaining weight and feeling like we're up to it uh, or not, uh, not up to par to what, how we're supposed to look um, with all the, 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 the periods that we go through as women in our, in our lives um, and the, the weight changes that we experience because of our, our bodies. Uh, so this was called Mirror. Uh, the one next to it is Zenubia. She is another queen from the Decolonizing History uh, series. Zenubia was the queen of Pal Palmyra um, during the Roman Empire. Uh, she was, again, Palmyra is, was a city-state in, in Syria. And um, Zenubia's husband, who was the um, a Roman uh, general, uh, was killed in battle. and. Um, in fact, he was poisoned. He wasn't killed, but he died. And she became the queen of this city-state, which was on the on the crossroads of, of a lot of travel. And so it was a very um, wealthy state. And at the time, there was a, a vacuum in, in the Roman Empire. There was no um, leadership. And she made use of that vacuum to declare Palmyra an independent state. Um, subsequently, um, the Romans uh, realized that and uh, uh, troops were sent to fight uh, Zenobia. And she was a hero because she was fighting alongside her city, um, the fighters in her, in her army, she was fighting with them and eventually was captured, lost and was captured. And as was uh, the habit with Roman um, uh, returning from battle victorious, they would bring back their loot and all the um, leaders that they had captured that would walk behind a parade uh, coming back to Rome. And it was said, there's a lot of legend that says that Zenobia came back um, in gold chains, you know, dressed in, in all her glory. And all the paintings that show Zenobia in the canon of Western art show her dressed in Roman dress, uh, almost naked, and all the portraits of Zenobia is Zenobia as a captive, Zenobia as a slave, Zenobia vanquished. Um, and I say, you know, Zenobia for most of her life was a queen and she was not wearing, um, she was wearing clothes, first of all, and she was not in gold chains. <laughs> so I reimagined Zenobia as she would um, be wearing 
at that time and how I would I thought she would look um, rather than the way that she was portrayed in all the Orientalist paintings uh, of the 17th through the 19th century. So this is Zenobia. Again, I use fabric and beads and um, I sew, I, the, the dress, the, the neck of the dress is, is hand sewn and attached. Um, and I do some research, historical research as to how, you know, from in, in the case of Palmyra, uh, from the funerary tombs where they had a lot of um, uh, figures in relief of the people that were buried there and what they were wearing, the headdress and the dresses and the jewelry. So it was a fun project, this one, because it involved a lot of research. Uh, this is the, the Bride series. Uh, there are six of them. Uh, and they're called I Dream on Color also is as a play on words because of the color, color of skin, color of the dress. Um, whenever in, in, in pop culture, we think of a bride, we think of a white dress. Um, so the first, the first of these paintings was on the right uh, and it's called um, White Dreams uh, because you know, when we are little and we are playing with the Barbies and we are reading the stories of Disney and we, uh, we imagine ourselves as girls um, in bridal dresses and these bridal dresses are always white. And then we grow up uh, and we realize that no, maybe the people around us don't wear white uh, in, in their weddings. They wear other things. Uh, and these other things have different meanings and have a lot of depth to them. Um, uh, so much so that in a lot of cultures now they have different days where the bride wears white in one day and the the cultural color in the other, just because white was became such a popular and um, um, cultural, culturally, um, um, how would I describe it? A superior color for a bride. So if you wanted to really be the image of the bride that every little girl had, uh, you had to be uh, in white. Uh, and so I, I thought about that idea and I developed it further. The second painting uh, of the brides was, was the one on the left uh, and it's called, it's called Gold Dreams. And it talks about um, what, how do we celebrate love at the end of the day? Because this is what this is, a celebration of love and family. And, and that is the gold. Uh, the gold is not in what we wear and what color that dress is, but in who we are, who we're marrying, why we're marrying them, how life goes on. Um, and, and the different shapes and forms that love takes. Uh, so this was uh, uh, the gold standard, basically, of, of the celebration of love and family. Uh, the one in the middle um, returns to that idea. It's a, it's a Palestinian bride. And it returns to that idea of uh, how we can use fabric uh, as as an act of uh, uh, an act of a political act, because in in Palestine uh, in the occupied territories, women are embroidering their dresses in um, a symbolic uh, way to mean that to to remind everybody that they still exist. Um, so they stand firm in their identity, in in their remaining who they are. Um, and, and their dresses reflect that. The, so now there is a whole line of uh, Palestinian embroidery that means a lot more than it used to mean uh, pre-1948, uh, where these, these acts of mere taking a piece of cloth and embroidering on it becomes an act of um, self-defiance and self-determination. And this was called uh, Olive Dreams uh, because uh, the Palestinian brides uh, are come from the land of olives and olive trees. And uh, this bride may be marrying uh, a human, but she also may be marrying the land. Um, and, and that's what defines her. Um, the next one uh, from the bride series, um, is Emerald Dreams. It's on the, the green one. And it's an Emirati bride. Uh, so brides in the UAE uh, celebrate, uh, they used to celebrate throughout seven days 
Um, and the nights where they uh, apply henna to their hands and their feet is the night that they wear green mostly uh, to symbolize or to go back to the idea of the green leaf of the henna and the henna application. So if you see that bride has uh, the henna on her hands, uh, she's a typical uh, dressed in a typical Emirati bridal fashion where there are flowers and gold in her hair around her neck, on her um, dress and on her arms. Um, and she is experiencing a celebration of love and family in green this time rather than white. The one in the middle is Coral Dreams. Uh, and in, in that uh, painting, I talk about, uh, first of all, the, the beauty of the headdress that comes from the African countries and the fact that there are, you know, um, all these African countries and, and what everybody sees when they see this is one story, one continent, where, whereas there are countless and there are countless colors that are celebrated in countless ways. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a statement on the, on the one dimensionality of, of how the world sees Africa and um, on the beauty uh, that you find in textures and fabrics and um, beads in Africa and all the Afri different African countries in their different ways. Uh, and it can go back to the idea of what's happening to African artifacts in museums nowadays and, and the, uh, the post-colonial image of Africa in Europe and outside Europe uh, and how that affects the life of everyday women um, in each African country. Uh, the one on the right uh, is um, Scarlet Dreams. And it's a, a Chinese bride. And it talks about uh, how deep uh, the ceremony uh, of the bride in China is and how meaningful every single symbol in it is and how it involves not just the bride and the groom, but it's, a, it's a, more so a celebration of the family in, in every little um, thing that they do, including the red dress and, and the red headdress. Um, and it's, again, thinking about how different brides in different cultures will wear different colors um, that mean so much more than the white dress that some of them still will pick at the end. <laughs> so that's the bride series. So thank you so much for Everything you said, I learned so much already, but I have some questions <laughs> at the end. It was fantastic. So thank you so much. Thank you. But first I wanted to say that I really love how you approach different issues um, on a global scale. I love that, you know, like you, you're you really covering things that are present with us every single day. And it's, it's just really interesting to see that you're not only talking about the issues, but you also show the power as well, which is just incredible. But I wanted to ask you, you know, my first question is about the touching part. And that was definitely something I did not expect. And yeah. you talked about it beautifully, but I wanted to ask you from the other side, what is the people's reaction when you tell them you can you're free to touch mm. it? Well, when I exhibit, uh, it's always very refreshing because people, more so, more so younger people, but people generally, especially with the skirts, uh, they will come and they will touch the skirts. And usually when there's somebody with me uh, in, in any show that the, these are hanging, they go like, oh, you know, tell them not to touch. And I say, no, please yeah. come and touch, touch, feel me, see what we go through, what, how, how it feels to be me when I'm doing this work. Uh, and how these women feel wearing the skirts, uh, you know, let's connect. Because I believe that, you know, art, something has happened in, in, in the academy of art. It's, it, it has become something that is uh, above us, more important than we are. Art dealers are, are, are celebrities and, and, and millions are paid that I really 
feel is a meaningless thing that we are doing. Uh, again, putting status to something that artists never meant as status, because now people who can own amazing paintings are only super, super rich people. So what I am doing is I am bringing it back home. I'm saying art is transient and so are we. Um, I don't know if Leonardo wanted uh, this for his artwork. And um, maybe these crazy people that are throwing tomato sauce on, on the paintings nowadays are saying that in a way where, you know, you're putting this money into this and not in saving the planet or feeding people or saving uh, or, or buying medicine. Uh, art is something that we feel and feelings are transient and so should be experienced in the way that they were made. And, <clears throat> and that, is, that is the big thing about touching for me. Thank and you. if it gets ruined, we do it over. <laughs> you know, we could do it once, we could do it twice, we can do it ten times. <laughs> that's the fun of it. That that's the 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 beauty of it. That it's not so serious. It's not like ruining the life of a child, you know, where you can't undo it. Ruin the painting, and I will make another one. <laughs> <laughs> I love that approach. And yeah, um, I wanted to ask you about the fabric. So first of all, like there are two questions, sort of. Uh, first of all, how do you get your fabric? And my second question sort of relates to that. So at, in some of the pieces where you show, um, you know, cultural differences as well, are the fabrics authentic? Or, or do you just pick something that resembles the, the real? Um, most, 99% of my fabrics are recycled. Mm -hmm. um and it's it's hilarious because a lot of my friends uh, give me scarves and old uh, you know lingerie and <laughs> <laughs> and then they see them in another context <laughs> in, the, in the paintings so no it's all imaginary um except for maybe uh the, the arab bride um the scarf on the hijab uh, which are from my life and therefore they are more uh, re realistic but everything else is imagined it's it's kind of like the it's kind of like the process of reimagining what the queens looked like mm -hmm. i don't know what they looked like but i am imagining it oh. and so i am imagining uh, these these um, fabrics as they would be in in that context because a lot of it is found found fabric mm -hmm. and i mean it works well like i would believe <laughs> you are like shipping and buying things from all around the world <laughs> it has that feeling that that flavor of you know having that cultural element there so mm. i love that thank you so much yeah and uh, sometimes you know there's one day there's a table cover in my house and the next day it's not there <laughs> <laughs> Uh, or or there's a skirt that I wear and then I think oh that would work <laughs> yeah. so yeah it's mixing life and and art and also you know working towards the environment right because you're recycling things so yeah that... I mean reusing yeah the practice of reusing I guess is you know tiny parts uh, a statement yeah I love that <laughs> so much Okay, so if no one has any questions. Yes, uh, Mona, this is Brian. Hello. <laughs> hey, hello, hi, I'm calling from Hong Kong. It's actually at about 2 a.m. at the moment. Oh, oh wow. thank you so much really, for joining. <laughs> I really enjoyed the whole session and um, Gia, Petra, amazing work. And I just want to point out to, to Gia, Gia is that you know, her knowledge, you know, her talent, and how she actually put all the current issues and and former stories via you know her work in fabric is just amazing. So I just want to tell her Thank that you. I'm so proud of of being her classmate. Actually, <laughs> Thank you. We're in museum studies uh, program together, Brian. We've never met. It's an online program. So Brian, it's really nice to hear your voice and know that you're here. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming and for, for that wonderful comment.
And I agree. I mean, as I said, I've already learned so much and I'm really impressed with like all the facts that you're giving, because that's absolutely amazing to to be able to provide that through your work as well. Um, and it's, it's definitely I always say this and it will probably be on each of the sessions that I host. It's so wonderful to, you know, one layer is when I'm installing the show because I get to look at the pieces in more depth, but then meeting the artist, even though it's virtually and learning more you know, about the pieces, about their art practices, seeing things in details and actually like stopping and looking piece by piece while the artists are describing the pieces and then really like seeing things that you haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. That's so powerful. So thank you so much for, for that. And I will um, end this session with massive thank you. Thank you, so everyone who joined. Thank you Petra, for sharing thank this. You. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Mama. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful day or evening or night, wherever you, you are. And I can't wait to see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.